I'm so casual, it's our, oh. it's our office party today, it's fine. No, that's, what I, that's what I heard. Um, this is my laptop, I'm running it off of this, so you can um, set your remote. Great. And I can, if you prefer, I can duplicate it so you don't actually have to look back. Is that, sure, that'd be great. Let me, let me, yeah, let me fix that real quick. Um, and you'll be broadcasting. Yeah, we're broadcasting to the whole um, agency. Let me. Started. So, good afternoon. Welcome to the CM Seminar Series presentation for August. My name is David Winchell. I'm the chair of the Seminar Series, and I also just want to thank you all for being here today. Um, if you're dialing in over the phone, um, please just mute your line now if you haven't already, and you'll be able to unmute it later on and, and ask a question if, you, if you'd like. Um, just by way of background, the Seminar Series was originally created to provide a, a forum for CMS employees to learn about the work going on in CM in particular. But um, recently, we've been expanding that to feature work going on in other parts of the agency. There's just a lot of interesting work going on around the agency, and we're really excited to be able to feature more of it uh, than we used to. Um, and today, we're looking at the, uh, the lean process improvement stuff going on in the Office of the Administrator. I'm so thrilled to have Dr. Larson here with us today. So just to introduce him a bit, um, Kevin Larson is the director of the Continuous Improvement and Strategic Planning staff at CMS. He leads the CMS Lean Transformation, advises on health IT policy and care transformation. He previously served for four years as the medical director of meaningful use at the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT at the department level, where he led ONC's work on quality policy, measurement, and improvement, including clinical decision support and registries. Uh, prior to working for the federal government, he was the chief medical information, sorry, informatics officer and associate medical director at Hennepin County Medical Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He's also an associate professor of medicine at the University of Minnesota, where his research includes healthcare financing for people living in poverty, um, computer systems to support clinical decision making, and health literacy. And in Minneapolis, he was also the medical director of the Center for Urban Health, a hospital communi community collaboration to eliminate health disparities. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Larson, as he presents to us today on what's going on with Lean at CMS. Thank you. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, excuse the very casual outfit. It's our it's our work party as my team. So I uh, left the pool party at Ellicott City with crabs and uh, and pulled pork and came over here for this talk. And then I'll go back there for more crabs and pulled pork. So <laughs> happy to be here. Um, so have you ever felt like this? Um, what we find in government is that uh, we do a lot of work in um, uh, review of documents, review of paper, and review of policies, and review of contracts. And if we don't get it right, our days feel like this, whether it's an electronic set of email like this, or whether it's actual paper like this, uh, too many people actually have this experience. Um, lean is uh, actually not an acronym. It's a made-up word, um, much like agile is a made-up word, uh, to describe a set of principles that have been proven over and over again in industry to be an effective set of principles and tools that when used together lead to a different way of work. So one of the partners that we have in helping us with our lean transformation is an organization called the Lean Enterprise Institute. And if you're interested, they've got a lot of great stuff, a lot of free stuff on the web. They're a not-for-profit. They've been very gracious, but we also contract and partner with them for them to provide some help and support for us. Many of the founders of Lean in the U.S. Uh, actually now work uh, and consult through the Lean Enterprise Institute. Um, so here's a definition that they put forward, that it's uh, delivering the most value from the customer's perspective while consuming the fewest resources 
and engaging the people in the workplace in continuous problem solving. So there's a lot of stuff baked into there. Um, but you'll see, if any of you are familiar with Agile, that there's a lot of similarity in how we think and how we go about approaching the work. And if anyone has questions throughout this, happy to have this be kind of conversational. So please feel free to stop me. Um, so here's a, uh, so one thing Lean isn't. Lean isn't just about getting rid, making things more efficient at the cost of poor quality products or a worse work environment. And uh, this is, I think, a terrific example of lean thinking in practice. So here there's a glass that, and the cartoon says the, the optimist says it's half full, and the pessimist says it's half empty. But the lean thinker says, why is the glass twice as big as it should be? So the idea is, why do we either have two, more glass than we have need of, because we only have this much water, or why haven't we filled it all the way up, because we have this much glass? So the idea is, how do we constantly think about right-sizing, not overproducing, not having too much supply, not wasting time and energy? So why do we do lean? What, what was the driver at CMS? What's the driver? So I just actually at noon gave a talk to a federal initiative. There's a whole set of lean initiatives across the federal government. Um, there's a group called the Federal Improvement Team, or FIT, organized through the General Services Administration, GSA. And they organize lean at the Army, at the Marines, at the, at the USDA, at EPA. Welcome uh, to WebEx. Please enter your. Been there. <laughs> Done that. We need a lean initiative. Please enter your attendee ID number followed by the power. Welcome to WebEx. You will now be placed into the conference. Hi, it's Kevin. Can people on the phone hear us? Yes. <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> All right. We apologies for the late start with the with the phone conference. Where Kevin's been, yeah. Kevin's just gotten started, so we're we're just yeah. Getting... I'll just quickly run through these slides uh, to repeat for the people on the phone that um, lean is to help us as employees not feel like we're overwhelmed with work and feel like we have control of our work and control of how we improve so that we we can make a solution from this as opposed to feeling a victim from this. Um, and that lean thinking uh, really focuses on the customer and how are we always thinking about what does the customer want and value. And so one of the, the litmus tests we constantly give ourselves is if the customer knew we were doing this, would they be willing to pay for it? If the taxpayers knew we were reviewing this contract for the 15th time, would the taxpayers tell us that's a really good use of our time? And so that's the litmus test we want to put on top of this. And if the taxpayers wouldn't say that's a good use of our time, how can we fix it so we don't have to review the same contract 15 times? We can instead get it right the first time and make sure everybody's happy and it's 100% perfect the first time. That's a hard thing to aspire to, but that's what we try to aspire to because that's what our customers would want of us. And if we could live in a world where I could be really confident that the contract I build is 100% accurate the first time and nobody has any edits or corrections, I would be a much happier employee than if I am constantly worried about what somebody else is going to say that tells me I did it wrong yet again. How can I always get an A plus in, as an employee? And how can we be sure as an organization that we help everybody else get an A plus? So that we're all always getting A pluses on the test, not because we lower our standards, but because we help each other all achieve the highest standards we can achieve. So here's just another kind of cartoon way to describe that. So this is where I was when we got back on the phone. Um, why lean? So uh, we all know that our operational budgets are decreasing. That does not mean that our demands on us are decreasing. Our programs are often increasing in the number of people covered in the scope and the expectations we have of timeliness and customer service. So how do we achieve the kind of customer service we want, the appropriate program uh, implementation, the oversight that we know is our duty, 
but do that in an environment where we're not going to get more employees and where we're not going to get more money. The way to do that is to be working as effectively and efficiently as we all can work. How do each of us not waste time in the day because we didn't know about something or because a process was broken? How are we all, every day when we come into work, doing our best work all the time and not doing rework? Not, not re going over mistakes that were made. So we want to be better stewards of the taxpayer's dollars and we want um, everybody to go home feeling like, yes, today I did really good work, today I, I would get an A+. Uh, today I'm proud of what I've done for the American taxpayers. So again, for those on the phone, if you can mute if you're not speaking, but also happy to take questions throughout. Um, uh, this can be a conversation rather than just a talk. I have a quick question yeah, for the ahead. YouTube feed. I can barely hear the sound on the YouTube feed, so if I turn down my mute button, am I still allowed to turn up the volume on the, um, the feed? Yes, you should be able to do that. You can mute. Your microphone is different than your speaker, so you can mute your microphone while turning up your speaker. Okay, thank you. Yep. So some guiding principles. Um, so... Uh, we borrowed these again from the Lean Enterprise Institute. As I mentioned to the people in the room, that's an, a not-for-profit organization that is established to help people across the country work on lean. Um, and some of the things they help us think about are um, align, enable, and improve. So lean works not just in improvement. That's been what everyone thinks about. But it actually works on two other spheres, which is how do you align people to be focusing on the right work? And then how do you enable all of the people that are doing the work to do their best work all the time? So as we think about aligning our work, what does that mean? How, aligning means in some way strategy. How do we know we're working on the right things and not working on the wrong things? What are our priorities? And not just what are the high level priorities of the administration or of the administrator, but how do those priorities affect me in my everyday life? Why does that matter? Because I should be able to make decisions about what's important, what things do I focus on today as an employee. And I'm going to be making the best decisions if I know what our goal is as a group or as a division or as a center. And if I know what our goal is all the way down to my division level, I'm much better equipped at saying today, these are the things I should be working on. These are the things I should be fixing. This is the stuff that's a priority than if I don't have any sense of what it is we're actually trying to achieve overall as an organization, but also what are we trying to achieve as a division? What are our goals this year as a division? What's important to us this month? What's important to us this week? So we're working in alignment to create value for the customer. How are we sure that the, med the beneficiaries of Medicare or Medicaid or the marketplace plans, how are we sure that they're having more value because of the work that we're doing? How are we sure that we're, we don't just flip back and forth? How are we are consistent across the organization and through time that we're working with the same principles, the same goals in mind? And then another one is think systematically. So this isn't, um, or excuse me, think systemically. This isn't not think systematically. This is think systemically. How do we think about the whole system? So how do we not just think about what happens in Medicare, but how do we think about what happens for a dual eligible patient who has both Medicare and Medicaid and our impact of our program and our execution of the program to that person that has both of those things? How do we think about um, issues across the work that we do, not just in my own place where I have expertise? Enable principles. So these are, um, we're, we're talking about kind of the principles that underlie what it is we're talking about. So there are tools, there are specific actions and activities, but a lot of this derives from these principles, and it's really important to remember that the principles are more important than the tools. We'll teach a methodology like an A3, which we'll get to in a little bit, or we'll teach a methodology like a value stream improvement. Those are tools, and they work, but they work uh, they're, the more important than those tools are these principles. So a couple of the enable principles, one is lead with humility. This is actually well studied in the leadership literature, that the most humble leaders are actually the most effective leaders. 
Um, and anybody have some ideas why that might be? Yeah. Um, well, I think if you're the leader and you just you know go in and bark orders and um, you know give mandates, uh, I think people kind of shut down. Like, oh, I guess if the leader knows everything, there's you know there's no reason for me to give input. And then the people just shut down, and it's like a closed system. Yep. Whereas if the leader creates the space and asks, you know, what are your ideas? What do you think about this problem? And says. You know, just the same with humility. You know, I, I I don't know what the answer is. You know, you guys know the work, you know the process. What do you think? We how do you think we can solve this problem? And it, it opens people up and it gives people permission to like contribute and engage. Absolutely spot on. Absolutely. When you lead with humility, it allows the people that are the experts of the work, which are the people doing the work, to actually be the ones to say, well, you know, you may have done this ten years ago. But actually, right now, today, this is what we have to do. They put in these three new policies and this new IT system, and I know you want us to do it that old way, but it turns out it won't work anymore because we actually do this all the time, and we know that in the new world, in the new IT system, in the new policies, it doesn't work that way. If you're a leader that just comes in with a barked order and a technical solution, your team is going to not be fully productive, and they're not going to be fully creative, and you're not going to get the best answers because you're right, they're going to shut down, and they're not going to tell you the real ways to solve the problem because they've, they've come in with a presupposed solution. Another one of the principles is respect for every individual. Why do you suppose we care about that one? Anybody have ideas? Who's ever worked in a workplace where you don't feel respected? It's really hard to come into work every day, isn't it? It's really demoralizing. You don't really want to put in your best work. You kind of put the minimum amount of time on the clock. You pick the tasks that are not going to have any risks, that aren't really going to be the real tasks. Um, uh, in a respect for every individual, this says that we have a lot of, we have a, an organization of great employees. And how do we constantly live out that respect for our employees? How do we promote them? How do we help them be even better than they currently are? How does everybody get an A plus at the end of every day? And that's not our job to push them there. It's our job to build a really good system that supports them and helps them be really good every day. So an example I'll give about this, um, if I go to a restaurant and I get really bad service and a really cranky waiter that always gets my order wrong, I don't actually blame the waiter. Who do you think I blame? the management, the owner, because waiters actually flit around to different places. Like it's not a, for most people, it's not a career, right? So as a restaurant owner and a restaurant manager, you create a work environment that either helps your waiter be really good and on time and get everything out and be happy and pleasant, or you create an environment where your waiter isn't supported, their orders are always wrong, they have too many tables to wait on, and they are then cranky and, and irritable. It's the same thing in any other work environment. Our work environment can be the same way. That if we respect every individual and build a work environment that really supports and helps them uh, do their work, their best work, they'll be happier, they'll be more productive, they'll be better able to do that work. So these are really fundamental principles of, that underlie this work of lean. Um, and um, they're tied into improvement, but uh, it's easy to miss them unless you kind of think about them and talk about them. So improvement, so the, the three kind of cornerstones of this align, enable, and improve. Improvement is the one that gets the most um, discussion and the most talk and the most focus in Lean. And so Lean is fundamentally focusing on the process. Um, we think of all uh, things in an organization as having a process. So for example, uh, many of you here probably touch contracts. Is there a CMS uh, process for contracts? Is that the same process in every part of CMS? Is it transparent and visible and easy to understand what our process for contracts is? No, right? You could imagine if we were a, a, like a restaurant owner who runs a really good restaurant, everybody that touches a contract would know exactly how it goes, exactly how it works, what do I need to do, how to make it happen. So every day I, that I work on a contract, I get an A+. 
So that's a process that we have to think about as an organization. It's not one person's fault. This is not OAGM's fault. It's not any one person's fault. This is because as an organization, we don't have a consistent process that we say this is how it always works. And we don't have tools in place to make sure it works every time, all the time, with every new employee. Um, lean is derived from engineering and scientific principles. So the idea is that we are constantly looking for what, what's the data, not what's our perception, but what do we really know? What's the real data? What do we see? What can we observe? What's the data in this? So let's take contracts, for example. Um, we were working with a group in CMMI who said, gee, we hate how contracts work. Well, let's be more scientific about that. And eventually they got to, in last year, they missed 100% of their acquisition milestones. So now they had a scientifically observable process. They had data. They could count how many acquisition milestones they had. They could count how late they were in each and every acquisition milestone, which then lets them be able to come up with ideas that could solve how could we get better and not miss 100% of them? How could we only miss 30% of them? How could we only miss 50% of them? And try and test things to get better. Anybody idea know what? flow of value might mean? So that's another principle. Kara? Basically, um, the customer is the one pulling, and we're flowing to them, so they're getting it just in time when they need it, what, what they need. Exactly. They're getting it when they need it, when they want it. To my mind, the best example of this is to compare, let's say, Amazon to Sears. So. If you go to Sears, are you guaranteed they're going to have what you want? And you've got to drive there, right? And they may actually have too much of something you don't want and too little of something you do want. And so then you've got to wait. In Amazon, are they going to have just what you want? Are they going to get it to when you want it? So they, there they pull. They wait for the customer to say, yes, this is I want this now. So the customer is pulling, requesting for that thing. And they deliver to you just in time as the time you want it. So you're not waiting. Um, this is the idea of flow and pull of value. How do we not stack up too much stuff that nobody wants and then over inventory? And how do we not, how do we wait until the customer says they want something and then deliver it just at the instant they want it? That's the, that's the perfection. It's hard to get to perfection. But how do we get close to that place? So that we only deliver when you want it, but then it flows really smoothly and seamlessly just exactly at the time that you want it. Um, we also look hard at variation. We look hard to understand and manage variation. So a lot of us as workers, as people, um, think we like things to be really different one place to the next. And that's true, actually. But what happens at an organization is we spend a lot of time, money, and energy in managing that variation that people say they want. And much of the variation that people want, they don't really, in the end, if you deliver a really great product, they don't really need as much variation as they say they want. So think about Amazon again. Do you need 30 different ways to order something in Amazon? I don't, because it works. I don't care if I have 30 different ways I can do it. I'm happy to do it the one way that works. So as an organization, if you can get to things that really work, people actually are OK with far less variation. And you actually intentionally manage how much variation you have. And you know what variation is out there. To the point of contracts, we all kind of agreed, I saw heads nod, that we have a lot of different ways we manage contracts. So part of the trouble, if I move from one group to another group, well, you guys do it differently than we did it, mm -hmm. right? And so now you got to relearn all this stuff that should be pretty easy. But no, it's all different because I moved just across the aisle from here to there. So that's the kind of variation we look to understand. And we look to figure out when can we get rid of some of that variation so that it's easier to move from group A to group B or center A to center B. And you know that it's just going to work because it works in every place the same way. And the last one is hard for a lot of people to, react, to, uh, to put their head around, but we're seeking perfection. What do you think we mean by this? What would, yeah? Well, with patient safety, um, uh, we, 
we say let's go for zero defect. Yep. And the idea is if you set the target um, too low, then you're just going to kind of work to hit that low target. But if you set it to a very high target, even if the target is impossible or near impossible, then you're going to just keep forcing yourself to improve to hit zero defect. Yes, how would that work at CMS? That's absolutely right. And what, what, what would there be a way that that could work here at CMS? What could zero defects look like? Oh, well, I would say for the contracting, <clears throat> zero defects would be instead of a 100% failure rate, um, you could shoot for a 100% success rate. Absolutely. What if, what if our, our, our target here was Everybody that writes a contract gets it 100% right the first time, and there are never any edits in the contract after the first person finishes it. Pretty radical notion, right? That's a zero defect notion for a CMS contract process. But it's only when we hold out that perfection in our head that we're going to ever possibly hit it. And then we got to figure out why don't we hit it now? Well, somebody downstream has information I don't have now. Why don't they, why don't I have that information? Well, I don't know. Why don't I have that information? How can we best enable that employee to have all the information they need to know right when they need it? They're pulling for the information at exactly the right time so they can fill it out exactly perfectly so that that contract goes through without a single edit or a single change because we got it 100% perfect on the first try. That's the goal. That's seeking perfection. And then when we seek perfection for our customers, seeking perfection for a CMS beneficiary is we never make a billing error. They never have to call one of our helplines for help because they never need any help because they always knew exactly what they needed to know without actually calling us for help. That would be a zero defect experience as a CMS beneficiary. We're not there now. We do a great job. Like There's a lot of beneficiaries, and we do a great job. But it's only when we push ourselves to seek, well, how could we be better? How could we be perfect? How could we get rid of a call center because our stuff is so easy to use? It is so straightforward. It is so defect-free that no one ever has a question about it. That's the goal we want to try to achieve. Can I, yeah. Can I say something? So I, I, I think for when looking at seeking perfection, you have to be able to like, almost like identify your problem very clearly. You have to quantify it. And say, you know, like right now we're at 93 out of 100 or whatever it may be, but you have to be able to very succinctly identify what you're trying to do. And I think sometimes that it's difficult when you're in your routine of work and saying, well, I'm going to work, I'm doing what I can do and what I have control over. So it's hard to say, like, well, where is CMS being wasteful? You know, it's, it's such a lofty question that yes. makes it very hard to even start. It's a great, fantastic point. And, um, Couple of thoughts about that. Um, places that have gone on lean for a long time say they'd rather have a million one dollar improvements than one million dollar improvement. And what they mean by that is that it's each and every one of us attending to this all the time, rather than some great big new contract that comes in from McKinsey who says, oh, here's this new way, and here's your fancy PowerPoint, and here's your new way to do it. That what gets us there is us learning these things together and practicing them together each and every day. And all those small improvements actually ultimately build into a much more effectively working system. Um, we do need help in, in big cross things, and I'll get to how we're doing that too, but, but a lot of this is focused on how do we as teams, work teams, how do we as small groups, how do these people that pass stuff back and forth, how are we getting good at this all the time. Yeah. Um, I have an example um, that, I'll just give you the example. Uh, my, my mother, um, retired clinical nurse specialist, advanced degrees, uh, wanted to enroll in the Medicaid, Medicare Part B, so she called 1-800-MEDICARE, and there is a penalty that I guess you have to pay. She was told the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. She was told the penalty was like 300 and when it was only like 30. So she said, that can't be right. She called back. She was told 30-something. Mm -hmm. So I called, the, being an employee, I called the call center. I said, did you know that somebody told her that? And she said, yeah, we're working on that. It's like there was no evidence that they kept a record of how many incorrect things were told. Mm -hmm. 
and they there was no ev evidence of that they held anybody accountable for telling mm -hmm. the wrong thing. Unless you measure it, unless you hold the people accountable, that means they're free to make as many errors, and what do you really achieve in terms of improving things? You uh, really don't get there. I 100% agree, and that's a real, that's a real uh, example. That's totally, not made up. Totally with you, totally with you. The one thing that I would would think about reframing is that that call center person is probably not trying to make a mistake. That call center person is probably supported by a computer system that's trying to help them help your mom. And the question is, how do we collectively make sure that computer system and the information that the call center employee has is 100% accurate? Because if we have a 100% accurate information system that's helping that call center employee, then he or she is going to be much better because most people don't come to work saying, I want to make a mistake today. Most people don't. It's not your attitude. It's the fact that a mistake was made. Yeah. And, it, you know, you don't have to be blaming, you, but you have to say there was a, there was a mistake made. You can't yep. say, like, uh, well, you know, I've heard they are, but I'm not going to write it down, but I, it's good to know. You know, it's yeah. like, no, that's not good enough. You're exactly right. It's system accountability. How do we make our system accountable? How do we make our tools and processes and are all of us accountable for that? So that we are all constantly taking that feedback in and making CMS better. Yeah. Um, I was just going to add, um, so there's a saying, like a bad process beats up a good person every yep. single time. And so a lot of people are just following whatever process they have. Yeah. And if the process is broken, you're going to end up with a broken outcome. So right. lean is about process, going back to what you yep. said. If we could start improving our yep. processes, then we can have better outputs. It's, it's like the waiter who often gives me the wrong food. It's because the process in the restaurant is broken. Their ticketing system, their system of telling the waiter which things I need is broken. And so it's not a bad waiter usually. It's usually a broken process. Yeah, but let's be real about this. I mean, if you're if I call that number and 10 times I'm told the right thing and one time I'm not told the right thing, there has to be involvement of maybe somebody did not spend enough time to really get the answer. I'm saying it's not all like, hey, it ain't my fault. I yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like... It's you, yeah. yeah, it's still the, pro the process, but then you have to say a mistake was made. Well, maybe most of it was the process, but don't say that a mistake wasn't made. Or, or thanks, you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna record it. Yeah, we should take accountability. Absolutely, we should take accountability collectively. We should look at that feedback like you gave as gold mine. We should be saying, how do we take that feedback and use it to make our system better, to make CMS better? Yeah, yeah, I was just gonna piggyback on that and say um, one of the traps would be when we find a defect or hear one complaint we don't want to get lured into saying oh well it's only one defect only one complaint yeah. there's probably 99 other customers who have the same exactly. experience and the, like you said the one complaint should be treated like gold or treasure because there's a silent majority who's who's experienced that too we just don't know about it so I've seen managers in my old job say oh it only happened once or it only happened twice Per month, so you know, it's no big deal. But I think there's a hidden, you know, it's the tip of the iceberg. So. Yeah, that's exactly right. So um, here are some core principles in Lean. Um, we really focus on the customer. What do we? Oh, go ahead. Yes, somebody a question on the phone or a comment? Hello. So, yeah, so here are some principles that we identify the customer, we identify their requirements and the customer's expectations. So a, a little story about this, um, there's a really nice book about a health system that went through Lean and they brought in some people from Japan to help them think about it. They are building a brand new building and the people from Japan looked at their building plan and said, what are these big rooms with all these chairs? And the, the clinic said, oh, well, those are our waiting rooms. We're the, they're going to be beautiful. We're so proud of them. And the J Japanese people said, aren't you, who waits there? The doctors wait there? And they said, oh, no, no, that's where the patients wait. And they said, aren't you embarrassed that you make your customers wait? Why do you build the space for your customers to wait? Shouldn't you always be sure that the customer is the most important and they never, ever, ever have to wait? 
And it really reframed how that clinic thought about their work and about who was important and what was the rate limiting step. And they radically changed how they organized their clinic so that, that there was no waiting room. So now when I go to a clinic and I see an empty waiting room, I think they've got the process figured out. I don't think that they're slow. I think they've got the process figured out. And if I go to a clinic and I see a full waiting room, I think these guys don't value their customers' time very well. They make all their customers wait, and they haven't figured out how to not make their customers wait. They make their customers wait a lot. So we have to think about who is our customer and how are they the most important thing. And when we know that, how do we reorient our work so that, that they're driving what's important for us. So then you'll hear, and some of you have been involved in things called value streams. So a, a value stream is, is how, does, um, how does value move through an organization? A bit like an assembly line, it's easy to think about in manufacturing. If you're building a car, there's a value stream, almost like a literal movement through a factory. You start here and the value is added to all the way through the process. For us, we have those same kind of value streams, but they look a little different. We might have a contracting value stream, which says we start with a contract initiation and that contract moves through an assembly line of our organization and we add value to that contract each and every point until it finally is executed. So that would be like a value stream of the contract. Now, what we try to do is think about those in terms of what is important to a customer, not really what's important to us. So a contracting value stream is kind of important to us, but a customer value stream says, when does the customer ask us for something, and it would give them what they need. So it's when your mom calls in and has a question, have we answered her question? And that's the creating value through, the, through our organization. So what we try to do is get rid of all the wasted steps, all the things that a customer wouldn't want in that process uh, as we do an improvement process in lean. And then we want to make the production flow. And so this is another key principle that um, a lot of times um, it's natural for us to try to batch things. We, we do, so we, were, we worked on a project in correspondence and we found an office that um, for, for CMS beneficiaries mail They'll get a piece of mail in, and they'll put it in a stack, and only when they get five of them, they put a rubber band around it, and they move it to the next place. So that's called batch processing, and if it takes a month to get five, they'll wait a month, and that first one waits a month before they move all the rest on. Um, so flow says you don't actually batch and wait. You take one, and then you do the, as soon as you get it, you move it on to the next one. And that's how you get the difference between Amazon and Sears, because Sears batches, they send a big order to a factory, and the factory produces it, and they send that big order to a warehouse where it waits, and they send a whole bunch of stuff to the store, and all those steps take a long time. Amazon's figured out how to flow that so that they get it almost instantly from the factory through the, um, to delivery right to your house. So how do we flow in a kind of one piece at a time way instead of batch everything in great big batches so that we are waiting constantly between these big batches. We also want to induce pull between the steps. So anybody, anyone want to describe what pull is that's different than push? So the idea is pull is I get the, the, my next work when it's ready for me. It's not pushed on me and someone thinks that I should be next. So if you've ever watched that Lucia Ball commercial, uh, TV show and she's on the, the chocolate assembly line, oh, yeah. things are being pushed at her, right? She's getting pushed too much work that she can't actually do, and so it, there's all mess created. In a pull system, um, what would happen is she would have a box and she would just take as much as she could actually do, and then when that box is done, she would start pulling for the next box and the next work. So a pull system of work says, I do... The amount of work at, my, at the pace that I, is needed, and I'm the one in control of when that work comes to me, as opposed to someone pushing too much work in my way that's either, or I'm waiting because I'm waiting for them to push more. And then again, we're managing for perfection. We're trying to get this to be perfect. We're trying to get zero defects, zero waiting time. Um, nobody ever gets to perfect. But Amazon would never get to same-day delivery if they were comfortable with the three to five-day delivery that everybody else was. They have to aim at just-in-time, zero, zero minutes from order to delivery to even possibly get to same-day delivery. 
Um, so in Focus for the Customer, we are focusing on all aspects of the organization, and we want better outcomes for our customers at lowest cost. And a lot of people think, how can you possibly get perfection uh, with lower cost? Any ideas about that? How, how, does, how do you get better and, and it costs less? Well, you have a lean process to continuous improvement and you, 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 people have become trained and knowledgeable in how that process <laughs> works and they're doing it the same all the time. And after a while, the process improves, it speeds up, it keeps on going down. So therefore, you do reduce the cost because you're not interjecting any mm -hmm. defects or any defects. Yep. So that's saving a whole lot of cost just there on its, on its own. You're going to find the, the deep, when you do find defects, what are you going to do? You're going to pass it on to the right area based on yep. the process and improve it. Exactly. Imagine if you were confident that every single piece of paper that got handed to you was perfect from the last person. What? How different would your day be? If you were confident that every single piece of email or paper didn't need correction, didn't need rewrite, didn't need update, because you knew that it was perfect when it got to you, and all you had to do was your part, and the next person in line was also confident that now you added your part, and it's gonna be perfect when they get it. That is a dramatic decrease in rework, and that's how perfection actually leads to less cost. Because if you can get it right the first time, we're now paying over and over and over and over again for the same thing, because we didn't get it right the first time, we made the mistake the first time, and then we made a mistake the second time, we made a mistake the third time. So we, if we can really get it right the first time, and then you're confident that it's always perfect when it goes from the first person to the second person, and they're always confident that they're passing perfect on to the next one, everybody's happier, they're more productive, and you, you're, you're far more efficient. Um, so, and also, we define the quality or service of the product is not what we put into it, but is what the customer gets out of it. They don't care how much work it took us to get there. They just care if it, they like it or not. They just care if it works or not. And so we can give them all the stops so we want. Well, we worked super hard and over time, and we did this. Oh, they don't care. It doesn't work. That phone call to my mom does, didn't help. I don't care if you were working overtime then, and I don't care if you looked at five statutes. You gave me the wrong answer. She just needs the right answer. Um, so here's some of the different kinds of waste that we talk about in Lean. Um, and we, I won't go into these too much. We talked a little bit about some of these. So defects and rework are one of the key kinds of waste in Lean. Um, but there are also defects in overproduction, where we actually make more than we need. Um, and then they sit around and they get old or they get dusty or we can't ever use them in the end. Um, and defects in inventory. You see this in a lot of organizations where they think that there's not enough money for stuff. So they order too many reams of paper because they're not sure actually they're going to be able to get supplies again. So they actually stock up and have a whole room full of uh, reams of paper in their coffee room because they were afraid that they weren't getting enough supply money next month or next year or whenever. In a system that's working on pull and flow, you always know there's going to be enough reams of paper. You always know you can just go get it just in time. There's going to be enough. Um, waiting is another one, kind of that idea of the waiting room, especially the customer waiting. And then this idea of excess processing. We do more, we do more steps than we really need. So an example of excess processing, we worked with CCSQ on, a, on an approval process within one group. And this was a contract approval process, actually. And nobody realized it, but we found that there were 22 approval steps within that group for a single contract. And when they saw that, they're like, oh my god, this is crazy. And most of those were just signatures. And like nobody actually really wanted to sign it. They'd just been told they had to. So when they actually looked at the process, they could get rid of over half of all of the steps and not change the outcome, not change the product at all. They still had all the right kind of sign-offs and review. They just got rid of half of the ones that no one was actually looking at or paying any attention because they had just always done it that way. So I won't uh, do this video. Some of you that come to training, and it will be available to you. This is a uh, kind of funny video about hiring to see, but I'll kind of skip this for more conversation. 
Um, so the, one of the goals here is that we um, fix the whole system and not just fix each of the parts. And that's, again, a big challenge in a large, complicated organization like ours because there's no way any one of us can understand the whole system. It's no way possible. No matter how smart we are, how much long we've been here, how good we are at something, we don't get how all the parts work. But we want it to all work together in a seamless, integrated way. So how do we, each of us, work and control and improve our own space and then do that in partnership with the other people connected next to us so that we're all building a full system that works really well rather than um, a system that only works well for one thing but doesn't work well for something else. Um, IT is kind of good at this, uh, getting it wrong. So like um, a lot of my work in IT, we would think about security. And we could get a system really good for IT security. We could make sure that everything was really secure all the time. Turns out it made everybody less productive and efficient, and everybody hated it, and it didn't work because they had systems that they couldn't get into, and they had too many passwords that were broken. But we had made IT security really, really good. So how do you, we think that IT security isn't its own thing, but IT security is instead serving the customer and serving the organization, and the right IT security is the right thing that gets us customer value and gets us uh, every employee being able to do their job effectively. Thoughts about this? Questions about this? So some of the things that we do with Lean our, um, one of the tools we use is a process mapping tool. So Kara's here, and Kara's one of our um, Lean ambassadors, and she actually is the lead of Lean for CCSQ. Uh, and some of the work she does is in CCSQ help facilitate projects where they say, here's a strategically important something. We've got this problem, we want to fix it. And she works through the problem with the team, the people that are experts at it, and then they get together and they map out the process. They, talk, they get all the people that are there and they talk through how does it really work. It goes from here to here to here to here to here. So we collect data about that process and we look and map it out visually. And then they identify where is there the most waste in this? Where do we as the workers that actually do this work say, this is the spot where oh, we're always having to correct this, we're always going to have to rework this, we never get this right. And then they figure out how they want it to look, not how it is now, but how they want it to be. And then they do a bunch of experiments to figure out how can we get it better. And we use the word experiments very intentionally. So rather than saying we're going to change every contract tomorrow, we say what's the one thing we want to try, and how do we try that on one contract, and how will we know that it's better? Like how do we scientifically measure that what we did is better tomorrow than what we've done before? So that's the, in a nutshell, the kind of heart of this process mapping part and the process improvement part of Lean. And we do this for great big projects. We do this for little teeny tiny projects. We do this for in between size projects. There are all sorts of kinds of projects. So one of the ones, one of our great big projects we're working on right now is fixing the IT budgeting process. And that's a great big project that touches every part of CMS and it's huge amounts of money and time and activity, so it's a big investment in improvement. But there are lots of these smaller projects that can one group or center improve how they do clearance, how they one group or center uh, improve how they do process a certain kind of document that's a, a smaller scale kind of project. So at CMS, here's kind of the timeline. Um, there was, I'm sure, a lot of good work before 2010. Um, uh, I started in federal service in 2012. Um, in 2010 is when Don Berwick came and he had a big focus on quality improvement and so some of you may have been um, the improvement coaches that, that were trained at that time. There was a lot of great work done, a lot of great investment, a lot of good lessons learned. Um, one of the lessons we've learned is that training, co training improvement people without also training their managers was not very effective. So that's a lesson we're learning now. How do we both train the people that are there to do the improvement? And how do we train their managers and how to manage in an environment around coaching and constant improvement? Um, in 2012, we launched a, a lean program in CCSQ as part of a secretary innovation uh, fellowship project. 
And um, through that work, we focused on a particular uh, policy and program at CCSQ, and it worked really well. And from that success, we were then asked to do more and more and more in Linden. It was just in 2016 um, uh, that I was asked by Patrick Conway to come and help lead Lean here. I had been doing it with CCSQ and other federal testimony. Um, since 2012, but um, uh, joined CMS officially in 2016. These are some of our types of improvements. Again, I won't go into too many detail, but we do small improvements, something you can just do on your own. Uh, uh, a little bit bigger improvements that might be your work team, it might be your division. How do we as a division change how we do meetings? How do we as a division change how we route our Approvals, how do we as a division change how we process things that are really important to customers? Uh, all the way to these great big things that are uh, things that we do across CMS and sometimes even with other federal partners. Um, uh, how do we work cl more closely with FDA or how do we work more closely with um, an another federal agency in work that we share that our customers tell us we um, can make better? Uh, so how do we know that we're getting better? Well, we too are working in alignment, and we too are wanting to live out our own principles that we use scientific method to know that as we deploy lean, we're actually making improvements to the agency. So we've worked with the, the, uh, the SES team here, the senior executive leadership, on what are, they, what are their goals? How do, what do they want to see? And they've told us they want uh, community problem solvers. They want uh, every employee feeling like they can solve problems, every manager um, uh, encouraging problem solving and making a space for problem solving. And so because we've been told that by our executive team, we've been working to survey you, and many of you might have remember seeing our survey called the True North Problem Solver Survey, where we ask CMS employees, how is this working? How are you able to solve problems? Are you given help and permission to solve problems? Do you know how you can bring up an issue? If you see a defect in your area, do you know how to bring it up and do you know how to say, I think we should solve this? So here's the data we have to date. Um, we've done this survey now three times uh, this year. And we are uh, measuring how do people feel about their ability to solve problems. We're measuring how much they think they can collaborate on problem solving across the agency. And we're measuring, um, do they know about the use of um, problem solving tools? Are they comfortable they have a set of problem solving tools that they could use to solve problems in their own area? And you can see where we are. And we didn't expect dramatic jumps in any of these. And in fact, when we do the statistical analysis, we're still kind of flat in the first few months. But this is agency-wide. We're looking at big changes. Um, I won't go into these too much, but here are, oh well, here are a couple of, some of the things that you can uh, request for and get help with. So uh, I don't know how many of you are here from CM, or many of you from CM. So you guys have a lean ambassador within CM, her name is Felicia Rowe, she's fantastic. You can go to Felicia and she can help you with any number of these kind of things. You can also come to our team, the CISP, the Continuous Improvement and Strategic Planning Staff team that are in OA, and we can help you too. So one of the things you could get help with is a small-scale improvement project, something we call a Fed Biz Lean. It takes a couple of days. You use a few people, but the, most of the work happens after it. This is where you work to define what the process is, and then it's the rest of the work in doing the experiments to figure out, did those experiments actually change the process in the ways that you want to get a better outcome? Um, we also have some uh, course uh, in A3 Thinking, this has been a very popular course that we started offering this spring. Um, I'll get a little bit into what A3 is here in a minute, but the course is really focused on how do you coach other people in a consistent methodology of problem solving. How do you coach them to use scientific method to think through their problem and not jump to a solution? What we find over and over again as we do this class is that most of us at CMS, like most people around the country, um, when they have a problem in their head, they jump to a solution right away. And that's really natural. Part of the, the work we do with this A3 thinking is help you with tools to say, wait a minute, do I really understand this problem? 
Do I really know what the data is? Do I really know what my customers think? Do I really know what the people that are supplying me with stuff and I'm handing things to, do I know what they think and what they do? And A3 thinking is a process to help you do that. Um, we also do visual management. You might have seen some posters and sticky boards uh, around the agency. What we know is that when um, you make a priority to post your progress and track things together, that, that can be a really effective tool in the full team rallying around and knowing what's important and how to improve. And then we work um, on strategy and strategy deployment. We help and go in and, and work with you and your leadership on what, what's important to you. What is your strategy? What are your key initiatives you want to focus on this year so that you can have that clarity within your center or office or uh, group? So here are some examples of these tools in everyday life. These are just some of our uh, some process mapping uh, activities, some of our standard documents around chartering and uh, project planning. Um, how to choose a topic. Um, and then here's a little bit about A3 thinking. So uh, an A3 is, is a visual storyboard. It's a consistent way to describe a problem. And it's structured so that you focus most of your time on making sure you're addressing the right problem. And that when you have that problem, you've articulated it in a measurable way that's time bound. So that as you think about solutions, they can be measurable and you can do an experiment and know if your solution had an improvement. So for example, in contracting, um, I think I highlighted that this one part of CMS said they had missed last year 100% of their acquisition milestones. So now they actually, that in 2016, missed 100% of their acquisition milestones. That is a time-bound, measurable contracting problem that they can say, we think if we try this thing, we'll be able to hit 50% of our contracting milestones. And that gives them an experiment with an actual measure that they would know that they're better, as opposed to saying, we hate how it works now, let's just try something else. And they don't really know if it's better, they just have opinions. Um, so here's some more examples about an A3. It, it tells a story, it's a way to communicate this problem to other people, why it's important, what the data is, what you've actually seen, so that they're more likely to try and experiment with you because you can tell them that this is what we've seen from our data. Uh, here are some examples of some of the larger pro process improvement activities we've done. Um, we had a, a big um, Kaizen, a big improvement of activity in CCSQ, where we looked at how we were doing um, business requirements for one of our big data systems and found that we were uh, it was a slow process that wasn't getting us the results we wanted, and we were actually wasting a lot of time and money. So we saved a really significant amount of time and money in it by improving that business requirement gathering process for a data system. And in fact, we freed up two full CMS FTEs that we could deploy to other activities because they no longer had to do business requirement uh, uh, gathering. Just two last slides. Uh, we do offer classes. We have this thing called the Lean Academy. And the courses are available on um, LMS. So if you want to come learn more, have a full day in learning A3 thinking or a half day in learning some basics, uh, uh, or come and bring a group and learn how to do this um, FedBizLean, oh, you can do that. Um, we have this, I guess, sorry, I had two more slides. We have the our CISP team of 12 people uh, in the Continuous Improvement and Strategic Planning staff. Come to us, ask us, we're here to help you. But we also have a whole number of lean ambassadors throughout CMS, people that are trained, uh, that are available, and often know your group and your area and your work. And here's how to get a hold of us. We're available through SharePoint. This is on the CMS SharePoint site. Um, uh, if you just search lean, you'll get us. Here's a consult request button. You can put in a, any kind of request you want, and we monitor that every day, and get back to you and say, hey, thank you. Um, here, we can help you. You've got, you've got Felicia Rowe and CM. Let's have a meeting with you guys and Felicia and see what we can do together. And with that, I think I'm done. OK, I think, unfortunately, we are, we're out of time for questions. But I'm sure Kevin will be happy to chat with people in the room if you want to come exactly. up. And uh, yeah. these, the slides will be posted on our, the CM Seminar Series website, which is available on the internet. Um, so they should be going up really shortly. 
And um, I want to thank Kevin and everyone on the phone and everyone here in person. Thanks very much for being here. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I was hoping that people could hear this.